Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dissenter Weekly Update for February 4th, 2021. I'm Kevin Gastola, Managing Editor for Shadowproof.com, and I'm pleased to be joined by Brian, who has a few things for you before we get started on our whistleblower stories for the week. Hello, everyone. Hello, Kevin. Good to be back with you. Uh, just a reminder, if you haven't already, make sure that you're subscribed wherever you're watching. Um, and if you want to help Shadowproof continue to do the show, to publish reporting on our website, uh, for Kevin to continue doing the reporting that he does, um, there's a variety of different ways you can support us. We're 100% reader funded. So you can go to shadowproof.com slash donate. Uh, check out some of the options there. If you're watching on YouTube, I believe you should be able to donate during this stream. Um, so yeah, if you like what we're doing and you want to support, even just a couple dollars helps or uh, tell your friends, family, uh, anybody about us, that helps too. Um, with that, let's dive right into our first story, Kev. Um, we have several groups back federal legislation to protect whistleblowing scientists. What is our first story here? This is actually a reintroduced bill and some positive news. Uh, so I wasn't familiar that this was something that was being pushed for, but it definitely became much more essential that there be some kind of procedures or something in federal guidelines or that agencies organized to protect scientists after Donald Trump's presidency. Uh, it's intended to protect scientists at federal agencies from political or special interest meddling. So for example, uh, this is in the uh, this one sheet that was put together by Representative Paul Tonko, who points out that there, so these are really good examples from the last four years, what happened with the US government. There were political appointees that blocked the publishing of a report on PFAs, a chemical found in drinking water and polluted groundwater, and suppressed another report on the health risks of formaldehyde. Uh, at the urging of the chemical industry, the EPA scrapped its own recommended ban on chlorperifos, a pesticide proven to impair brain development in young children. The National Ac Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine was ordered to stop research on health risks for communities living near surface coal mining sites. So all of this due to the industry capture of people who were running these agencies, uh, their ability to get in the way of scientific research. So the bill is uh, intended to protect people who are doing the work that we think or I think is crucial. Uh, the bill contains a provision specifically for protecting um, the P anyone who would be uh, eligible or, or, or should be covered by whistleblower protections. Um, and this would protect the integrity of scientific and technological information. Uh, going on, it also would protect against adversarial actions or what we would call retaliation against people for doing their jobs, their day-to-day their -day regular orders of business, such as engaging in dishonesty, fraud, deceit, misrepresentation, manipulation, or other scientific or research misconduct, suppressing, altering, interfering, or impeding with the timely release of scientific or technical findings, intimidating or coercing people to alter or censor their reporting or findings, implementing institutional barriers to cooperation, and timely communication, these sorts of things that are obstructive and intended to protect um, industries that are bent on profit. So uh, I think this is a good piece of legislation. It was introduced um, in the, the last session of Congress. It's now introduced while Biden is president, uh, the conditions are much more favorable for passing this kind of a legislation. I don't know that I'd call it radical legislation. I just think at a minimum, we should have something like this probably on the books. It may be kind of stunning to con contemplate that these aren't already 
um, in stone somewhere at these agencies to protect people who are doing regular scientific work. But I know from doing the show for well over a year that there were a number of examples, particularly with the EPA and other agencies that in, were, were supposed to be conducting oversight or monitoring of, of chemicals and the, the industrial pollution and, and, and things of that nature and looking at climate change, et cetera, that, that, that they were interfered with uh, in really awful ways. Thank you, Kevin. Um, for our next story, we're seeing a surge in whistleblower complaints to the SEC during the pandemic. What do you have here? Uh, so first, I see some people in the comments saying hello. So I just wanted to say thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, as we move along here through these stories. So this this one about the Securities and Exchange Commission, this story comes from Bloomberg, and it uh, says that the complaints, the number of complaints have soared to 6,900. Uh, and in terms of percent, that's up 31%. So I think it's the highest on record according, according to this report, which it says that what they believe is happening is that a lot of employees working are now doing so remotely. They're isolated. They feel emboldened to speak out. Uh, one quote from the article is, it's never been easier to record a meeting when you can do it from your dining room table. Uh, so you can uh, create a video or you can create an audio file of any of these calls that you're on and expose what's going on if there's malfeasance or fraud. This disconnectedness might be making it easier for people to feel like they could challenge what's going on at their company. And then there's a note here that because of the lag in time between complaints and SEC investigations, the impact of this recent explosion in whistleblower tips will be felt long after employees return to the office. In other words, the dissenter weekly could potentially talk about the outcome of some of these complaints at the end of 2021 or well into 2022, because it is going to take a while to process what is being exposed by these whistleblowers. Sorry, Kevin, I'm a little slow on my trigger finger today. Um, that is actually really interesting, though. I, I hadn't really thought about that uh, changing potential for whistleblowing, uh, given the fact that everybody's working at home. So no more peer pressure. You know, you're yeah. not going to eat your lunch with the people you're blowing the whistle on. That's right. Although I wonder if there's in different ways, sort of an added layer of surveillance now uh, with, you know, the way that uh, meetings now reach into your home at the same time. So I'm sure it cuts both ways, but that's an interesting I wonder story. if they would want to be able to track if you're recording those meetings so that yeah. those aren't uh, uh, shared. Yeah, I guess we'll see. And I, I mean, maybe we'll see some... Uh, some new Silicon Valley startups that'll <laughs> lock down your, your conference and let you see the eye movements of all the people uh, watching your meetings. Um, anyway, let's move on to our next story here. We have whistleblower alleges Trump official abused authority, signed last minute agreement with ICE Union. What is this story? And I want to know what your reaction is to this, because it seems like okay. something that... Uh, someone, especially a right-wing politician, might work out with a police union to foreclose any kind of, uh, of reform that would, um, you know, not necessarily put us on the track to abolishing police, but be good for people in terms of criminal justice reform. Uh, and so Ken Cuccinelli, very well-known character, uh, was uh, an acting second-in-command at DHS, and he apparently signed a set of agreements with the Union for ICE, the immigration agency. And this union endorsed Trump in both 2016 and 2020. And according to whistleblower being represented by the Government Accountability Project, you know, one of these foremost groups that uh, is involved in a lot of these cases that we cover at Dissenter Weekly, uh, the agreements grant the ICE union extraordinary power and benefits far more than what DHS agreed upon with other employee unions, which did not endorse President Trump. The agreements confer on the union the ability to indefinitely delay changes to immigration enforcement policies and practices as well. 
the letter written. Uh, oh, and this is according to a letter that was written by David Sida, an attorney with the Government Accountability Project. This attorney adds that under the agreements, ICE expressly waived statutory management rights with negotiating parties, um, which negotiating parties typically know better than to waive. Even more shockingly, the agreements attempt to prohibit any challenge to their validity for eight years. The agreement might potentially give the ICE union unprecedented veto authority in many areas and it essentially um, you know, gives some guarantee on what amount of resources will be expended by ICE as well, which could be beneficial to the employees. So um, this, um, it's also noted in the coverage of this, uh, I'm pulling this from a BuzzFeed article, by the way, the controversial former acting deputy secretary signed a series of agreements that requires DHS to provide notice of immigration policy changes to jurisdictions to give them six months to review and submit comments. State of Texas, so they're, they're giving an example here, um, had signed an, an, one of the agreements and uh, eventually sued DHS over its implementation of a deportation moratorium claiming it violated the contract. So uh, this is, um, I think, pretty significant here as far as where the fault lines are going to be over what the Biden administration does with immigration. And it it sets the stage for a pretty distinct battle with the ICE. And I think as, as, as much as we want to be highly critical, um, and I don't want to let this stand as some kind of an excuse, but it's pretty clear here that the ICE union is is set up to try and thwart anything modest that the Biden administration might do to curtail the deportation machine. Um, but you know, just knowing what we know about um, these law enforcement unions, that we're always skeptical of whether they fit into the the wide labor movement because of where their allegiances lie. I'm curious how you react knowing that this ICE union is, is, is set up in this manner to be able to obstruct um, any, you know, any moratoriums on deportation. I mean, I think they might even be referring just to the modest deportation moratorium that Biden wants to have in place for like a month so he can review the policy and see if they want to stick with it. And even that they might object to because they want to keep doing their job and they're anti-immigrant. Yeah, no. Um, you know, I did not have prior knowledge of, of this until we got here on the stream, so I don't know how much I can really weigh in on it. I know that, uh, you know, I personally, and I think we've talked about on the show before, um, think that law enforcement unions are not actually labor unions for a variety of reasons. That's what I wanted you to say. I didn't. Right, yeah. I didn't. I didn't expect. I didn't expect you to know the specifics, but I yeah. know that generally speaking, I you're pretty. You're pretty good. You know the context of where these police and um, these kinds of agents unions lie. Yeah, I, I'd be interested to see how an agreement like this holds up. I know that you know you're alluding to. Uh, you mentioned like a lawsuit uh, that has already been filed in, in defending these contracts. Um, you know, I also know that. Just in general, the government uh, has a pretty good track record of busting and running roughshod over unions. So I guess really to me, the question is uh, what, how far and what kind of a fight would the Biden administration be willing to get into? Uh, how much of whatever political capital, if you believe that's a thing uh, that Biden has built up in these early days and, and the claims that he's made about immigration, you know, is he going to put his money where his mouth is and at the very least, uh, wage a public interest campaign uh, against uh, ICE workers who are engaging in this kind of behavior, regardless of what a contract says or not. Um, so, uh, so I don't know. I'm interested to check this out more, though. I mean, it's it is odd for us because we're abolish ICE people. Like we right. we would we just would prefer that it didn't exist. And so these government employees would be doing something else. We would, you know, we would want them to find jobs not deporting immigrants. <laughs> Yeah. Or not being involved in, I mean, if there's something that has to be done in order to handle the immigration system, you know, maybe they could be, you know, in a more humane sense, 
I don't think anybody at ICE wants to be doing this, but in a more humane sense, sense, maybe they could be helping these asylum seekers that come to our country, a place here in this country to live. Um, but that's not the kind of work that they want to be doing, if you, especially if you yeah. follow why they're supporting Donald Trump. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and it's just, it, it is kind of stunning to me to look at the contract and see that they're able to work in this stipulation that they get to steer the politics or the political agenda of the agency, because I don't know how many union contracts actually would get to set. Like, can you That's imagine if it's the, the union for the, it may be like a legit agreement anyways, because I don't know if you can bargain over what the, um, what, what the agenda for an agency is going to be. Uh, I mean, think about if like EPA employees in, in their union, if they were able to be like, we're going to make sure we, and fracking by 2025. And they're like, well, Joe Biden's like, nope, I've got gas companies I have to protect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think the question is, you know, I, I, I'm not a constitutional law scholar. I'm not a labor law scholar. I don't, I don't know. I would question whether something like that is constitutional in terms of giving, uh, signing a contract to hand over governmental powers over to uh, a union. But um, I think for me, I'm, I'm more interested in if this is actually a roadblock and an obstacle to policy, what is Joe Biden going to do about it, especially publicly? What is he going to do about it? Um, because yeah. I think these are the kinds of political lines that people are demanding be drawn right now. Uh, and so, so yeah, that's kind of where I come down on it. Um, fire, some, fire some people. Yeah. Um, or, you know, even just just go out in the press and talk about it. I would be even satisfied <laughs> with that first step, you know, instead of, uh, instead of having to like hug a blue lives matter flag or something. Um, so let's go on to our next story here. We have uh, the co-founder of a drone tech company mined classified information to cheat competitors. What is this story? I'm just going to read from it. I mean, it's got some stunning details and I clearly think that, this is an example. When I look at it, I, I immediately see a double standard for this person. I think this person that we're going to be re hearing about now is very lucky to have um, his allegiances in the military industrial complex where they lie because if, if he wasn't so close to believing in this the system, then he might be facing an Espionage Act of prosecution or something like it. So here it is. This is from Defense One. They report that the in 2014, this co-founder of an anti-drone technology company decided to leverage an unusual marketing asset, his employment at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. The employee obtained classified information, arranged access to lawmakers and other officials, and even entered his company, Drone Shield, in government sponsored drone competitions before his use of official credentials to boost his side hustle brought him down. It's an interesting look. It, well, I'm just gonna skip that. I don't need that editorial. So uh, Drone Shield, by the way, I get really annoying press releases from them all the time trying to pitch their, their, their stuff to me. I think at one point, cause I covered drones, I ended up on their list and I am never interested in whatever they're hawking. The 2014 report by the inspector general for this agency was obtained by the government accountability project. So again, they're, they're clearly doing some really good work provides. It, it, it basically shows how um, this employee worked for NGA's InnoVision directorate and he wrote program management reviews. The employee's name was redacted, but it was pretty clear who the, the individual was because it, he was identified as the co-founder of, of Drone Shield. So uh, it, the report continues. It says the employee used his title to build a sort of house of cards. In March 2014, he told the Department of Homeland Security representatives that Drone Shield had a cooperative research and development agreement with this geospatial agency. That enabled him to get his company entered into something that the DHS sponsored that I've never heard of before. But it sounds both absurd and dreadful. It's called the Drone Rodeo, a demonstration event for counter drone technology. DHS officials didn't know about his affiliation with the company. They assumed he was acting as an NGA official. 
the deception was potentially lucrative and illegal. He was able to receive access to proprietary and classified information because it was believed his attendance was for the U for his U.S. government business and and not for Drone Shield. So he wrangled a slot. He got the slot at the drone raid rodeo and persuaded the U.S. Army a month later to let Drone Shield enter the service's Black Dart counter drone live fire exercise. Again, another dreadful thing I don't know exists, but it's it's happening. They're like, I don't know. Um, remember like battle bots? It's like sounds like what's going on where like they have drones facing up against anti-drone technology and seeing who can win. So we're involved with DHS's drone detection program and are sponsoring a passive acoustic sensor, the employee wrote to Black Dart organizers. And then the employee added, this this co-founder added that Drone Shield had received the required official sponsorship from the Geospatial Intelligence Agency. He also told organizers that Drone Shield obtained acoustic signatures for the Puma and the Raven drones from the U.S. Army Night Vision Lab. That would pretend, potentially give them an advantage over competitors, enabling them to see drones other systems would not. So sources and methods, sources and methods, sources and methods. Like I'm constantly hearing officials who are speaking out against leaks, uh, saying that sources and methods were compromised. And I think like this seems like a pretty textbook example of someone sharing what U.S. military is, is, is doing in the field um, in ways that uh, in this case, or other businesses can profit off of and 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 find a way to to counter and uh and yet this person um i'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen i mean it 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 just seems like this person's very very fortunate to be uh facing some kind of a trial i don't want them to be put on trial i i don't i'm not a fan of of leak cases but this kind of conduct is exact kind of thing hawking classified information in order for yourself this is what they accused edward snowden of doing and it's not true um and then in this case it actually is true and no set with this individual for doing what he did it's a wild story i had not heard that thank you for bringing that to us kevin um, that's a good <laughs> the drone rodeo you want to go to the drone rodeo after after that. covid oh <laughs> jesus <my God. laughs> um we, uh, we're going to actually talk about Edward Snowden in a way in a minute here, but first, yeah. uh, we want to talk a little bit about Julian Assange, uh, in whose case the U S government has obtained an extension for filing grounds for appeal. Um, I know that you were pondering on Twitter, whether or not Biden might just drop the appeal altogether. Why don't you talk us through this a little bit? Yeah, this is just, uh, kind of, a perfunctory update here so everyone is uh, aware of what's going on with the Julian Assange case. The U.S. government um, or the U.S. Justice Department was able to get an extension. That means that they don't file the grounds for their appeal until February 12th. So February 12th, uh, that means that got a little over a week so not this Friday, but a week from tomorrow, they will have to file their appeal. So that, that to me, a, a grand opportunity to pressure the Biden administration to drop these charges against Julian Assange and to pressure them to abandon the appeal of the extradition decision. Uh, they've, uh, you know, obviously, I think they were granted this extension because the deadline was coming around the political transition to a new administration. Yet, uh, we, we, we don't want them to, obviously, we don't want them to file this uh, appeal and continue on with the case. And just today, uh, is less than an hour before we went to record the Dissenter Weekly, Biden, Joe Biden, was at the State Department. He gave a major foreign policy speech. Uh, I've yet to be, be able to, to dig into what was said, but I, I plan to in the future. There's a lot of big foreign policy news today, uh, including uh, a, a development that makes it seem 
as if the U.S. military and uh, govern the, the wider U.S. government is no longer going to support the Saudi Arabian uh, Saudi Arabia's military operations against uh, groups in in Yemen that they're no longer going to support that war, um, and and so. Uh, there's a lot to dig into from the last 24 hours. And Joe Biden was at the State Department. He said very clearly, a free press isn't an adversary. A free press is essential to the health of a democracy. And all the, you know, hashtag resistance people got really excited. And all these journalists that are going to lob nothing but softball questions at Biden for the next four years, took to their Twitter and they were quoting him and they were like, what a refreshing change of tone from Joe Biden. And the only thing I could think of is the way that he framed this statement because he said a free press isn't an adversary. So I start to think of how we actually have treated a media organization like WikiLeaks as an adversary for the last 10 years, that that is intelligence agency resources have been uh, committed to going after uh, the editor-in-chief, which was Julian Assange for some time, and then other individuals running the organization, that there was something called a manhunting time, and that was exposed by Edward Snowden when he revealed those documents, and that, that, that they had a grand jury that was investigating and it eventually led to Julian Assange. And then he says it's essential to the health of a democracy. I would not disagree with this platitude, but that's what it is, is a, is a platitude here. It's a nice bumper sticker slogan. It's something that you could put on the wall of your office in the White House, but it doesn't mean that you're doing anything to uphold of our democracy if you're these Espionage Act prosecutions to continue. They are eroding of the press. And there are other examples of things that have to be protected as well. I'd say that there's a lot that Joe Biden has to do with the Freedom of Information Act and um, how that has been torn and uh, shriveled up by the last four years of the Trump administration. It was already um, not not so great when it came to the Obama administration, but it wasn't terrible. People were still getting documents, and even some of them were sensitive documents. But now uh, there's got to be a ton of work that has to be done, especially with one year of the pandemic having elapsed. Uh, that its toll on the government during the crisis, and so there's just there's also like a whole bunch that has to be done. So the great. Uh, as far as tone shifting goes, platitude out of Joe Biden's mouth. Uh, it's a, a little irritating when you know that this country continues its case against Julian Assange. And so it's time. It's time for someone in the Biden administration to come out and publicly what they think about this and why it needs to go forward. And they need to have the courage to own it if this is what they keep doing and the whole there's going to be people all over the globe criticize them. There's going to be people also in China and Russia that exploit it disingenuously, just disingenuously to make it seem the U.S. government has no right to criticize them for rights abuses. Uh, and so it's it's time for them to decide what they want to do. Are they going to keep going on with this case? Uh, if they want to back off, great. I'm going to welcome it. I'm going to say they made the right decision. They don't technically until they file their grounds for appeal. But then after that, they're in my book just as bad as Donald Trump uh, because they may not have started against Julian Assange, but uh, because they aren't ending his execution, um, they're, they're going to be just as responsible for what is happening to him going forward. Yep. Every administration has their leakers too. So I'm sure even uh, Assange's case notwithstanding, we'll see. Uh, how Biden treats his leaguers. Um, so, yeah, let's move on to our last story here. Uh, there's a new low for whistleblower coverage at MSNBC. Can I don't know if people out there believe that, uh, but I'm here to tell you it's true. Uh, MSNBC is pit reality winner against Edward Snowden in a 
really disgusting clip uh, that featured reality winner's mom. Isn't that right, Kevin? Why don't you tell yeah. us a little bit? About yeah. This? So I uh, had a fart with this yesterday. I did to deconstruct it for my viewers on our stream on the Shadowproof YouTube channel yesterday. And then I didn't understand technology and what was going on with, with the, the software we use. So I, I, I bailed and said we would do it today. So I think uh, there's not a whole there's not a whole lot to set up. Uh, let's go ahead and, and show it to you. But what you just need to know is that for three and a half years that this folded, MSNBC never had mother on. Um, and as far as I can tell, they never really did any meaningful coverage reality. Sometimes the name would be dropped by guests would be in past, but they never really did talk or dig going on with this case. And this is the first time that they did you to see how they decided to cover it because uh, I wrote about this at letter, the center uh, and then just so you know this is memorialized and i can always go back to it and cite it i wanted to have a clip here so i'm going to play this through and i wasn't uploaded anywhere i recorded this with my phone it might look a little amateurish but everybody can hear it msnbc did not upload the full segment and i think didn't upload the full segment um because well you'll see why all right, here, I'll play it. Here we go. In 2017, reality winner was a 25-year-old Air Force veteran working as an NSA contractor when she leaked some of the earliest evidence of Russia's attack on our voting system. She printed out a classified NSA report confirming that Russian hackers had targeted an election software company and 122 election officials. And she sent it to the news outlet, The Intercept. That leak served as a warning about the vulnerability of our voting system, something that even the Department of Homeland Security was slow to acknowledge at the time. But Winner was quickly arrested, thanks in large part to the carelessness of the reporters at The Intercept, who failed to protect her identity as their source. As The New York Times details, the lead reporter on the story sent a copy of the document, which contained a crease showing it had been printed out to the NSA, Media Affairs Office, all but identifying Ms. Winner as the leaker. Winner ultimately pleaded guilty in 2018 and is still serving a sentence of over five years. That's the longest ever sentence imposed in federal court for an unauthorized release of government information to the media, according to prosecutors. Winner is languishing in prison, while figures like Edward Snowden have become the darlings of civil libertarians. Her petition for clemency was overlooked by the former president, who went on to pardon his cronies, convicted in the Russia probe. Now, his winner's mother is pinning her hopes on the new president as the Biden administration takes a harder line toward Russia. Joining me now is reality winner's mom, Billy Winner Davis, Malcolm Nance, U.S. intelligence expert, intelligence expert. And Ms. Winner Davis, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's been a long road uh, trying to get to this interview to happen. So thank you for being so flexible with us as breaking news overturned our previous attempts to do this. Talk to me about reality. Yeah. What, is, what did she, what was her goal in your mind? Um, and, do, and, and do you think that she was treated the way other leakers have been in the past, put it that way? So, so first of all, thank you so much, Joy, for having me on. It is such an honor. I'm, I'm truly grateful. I, I believe that my daughter, first of all, my daughter and I have never, ever had a conversation with regard to why she did, why she did this, why she released this vital piece of information. But knowing my daughter and looking at her social media posts and the interrogation that the FBI did with her, you know, my daughter believed that Trump was the very worst thing that could ever happen to America for many reasons, as, as a lot of us. And here my daughter was torn with hearing the lies that this administration was telling the American people, trying to say that the Russian investigation was all a hoax. And my daughter had a piece of evidence right in front of her, and she needed this to get out to the American people. 
and no one else was releasing it and she took it upon herself to do it for you know do it for us can you pause it for a second mm -hmm. I think that she went oh, to this particular second. news outlet got it so that's that's three minutes i just want to make a couple points and then we'll we'll keep going and cover the last five minutes but so my biggest gripe is how this is all set up because as you can see from the way they frame it it's not just inviting billy winner davis reality winner's mother on to make a pitch to the country on why her daughter deserves to be given compassionate release and, and or a commutation of her sentence remember um it, it's it's about Edward Snowden has supporters in the Republican Party, and those Republicans don't support Reality Winner. And how dare they? How dare they support Edward Snowden over Reality Winner? And to me, this is really despicable to pit whistleblower versus whistleblower. I've gone above and beyond to try to grow solidarity, not destroy solidarity between people. Um, Billy. Winner Davis comes on. She articulates why she winner engaged in what she did, why she decided to reveal uh, this document to the intercept. And she doesn't actually know. She's never her daughter. I know that this is fact. I know that she's representing uh, the truth here. And she says that she was hearing in the media didn't match what she was reading as an NSA uh, linguist. And she, she document she gave it to the intercept. It was intercept to verify it and figure out what the contents meant and if they really meant what they meant. And there's a whole separate issue about the content document, but they're irrelevant. They're irrelevant to this moment because what this video was here, what this segment was supposed to be, was her coming on and talking about the whistleblower intentions of Reality Winner and 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 how. The, the viewers of MSNBC should get on board with supporting daughter. MSNBC named it as this thing of, oh my God, people support Snowden over reality. And isn't that awful? Also, um, in a, the, that aspect of this, there was this whole thing where uh, they want to drag Billy Winter Davis into the intercept. Um, and so you'll, you'll see that um, going as much as their own flaws. Um, again, that's not the message that she's here to convey. That's not what she's comfortable with. And she shouldn't be in, dr uh, dragged into battle. Uh, obviously, MSNBC won't want to pass up any opportunity to make itself look better as a corporate gatekeeper than The Intercept want to highlight massive failures of The Intercept in order to make it seem like MSNBC is this outlet that we should all celebrate. Um, and, and so um, anyways, um, here is uh, the next part of the clip. Go ahead um, and continue. Um, there, um, Malcolm Nance is going to be brought in and, and we'll see um, how this continues to go downhill because it had been involved in the past in issues like the Edward Snowden case, did she think that that was a sympathetic outlet for her? And what do you make of what happened as a result of that same news outlet not really concealing her identity? Yeah, I'm not really sure about why reality uh, went to the intercept. I know that, you know, anybody in NSA is, you know, warned about Edward Snowden, and I know that there's a natural curiosity to go there. Um, you know, go to the intercept. And so I really don't know that piece of it. And I, I do realize that mistakes were made. Mistakes were made both by the intercept and by my, by my daughter that led the FBI straight to her door. But I can't blame the intercept for what's happened to my daughter. I blame Trump and I blame Trump's DOJ for what's happened to my daughter. They're the ones who arrested her, who denied her bail who have persecuted her under the Espionage Act, who have denied her compassionate release, and who have made sure that she got the longest ever sentence for a crime of this nature in the United States. I blame Trump. I blame his DOJ for this. And 
you know, Kamala Lambergi went here because, you know, we've not talked a lot about mm. the, the Snowden case, and he is sort of a cause celeb for people who see themselves as civil, li civil libertarians, sort of, you know, a, a purists. Mm. Um, but the House Intelligence Report in 2016 found that the vast majority of the documents that Mr. Snowden stole really had nothing to do with programs impacting individual privacy interests. They instead pertained to the military, defense, and intelligence programs of great interest to America's adversaries. And he is now in Russia, where he has safe haven. And yet you've seen Republican lawmakers pushing the former president to pardon him. There have been a lot of people on the other side of the aisle also pushing for a pardon for him. Why do you suppose that reality story has not become the kind of cause celeb um, for those who care about, you know, information getting out that could help the public? This is helping expose our voting systems were, were uh, targeted. Well, first, let me... Let me uh give my thanks to uh, Miss Winner's mother. Uh, I know exactly where your daughter comes from. I was cryptologic linguist. She was a Persian linguist. I was an Arabic linguist. We went to the same schools, the same training facilities. I've been assigned to the same place that she was assigned at some points in her career. Uh, and when she became a civilian contractor, you could understand the allure of wanting to go out there and make a significant impact in a very uh, important you know, story of the day. But on the other hand, uh, what she did was wrong. She released classified information, and there's a way to do this. Take a look at Colonel Alexander Vindman and others. Um, that's water under the bridge. But why the right wing has Edward Snowden as a cause celeb? That man's a straight up traitor. I mean, he literally exposed programs. I swore to die before I would ever release in the hands of our enemies. And he did it with such blithe spiritness, he joined the CIA and NSA with the intent to release this information. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> you can pa pause it there. Okay. She needs to, she show so I love this part of the video because that's how the broadcast happened. You notice there was a technical glitch. Malcolm Nance's speechifying was so batshit crazy that my theory is the technology itself like <laughs> couldn't even handle it anymore. Uh, because uh, what he's saying there that Edward Snowden joined up with the CIA and the NSA knowing he was going to leak doc is absolutely false. Uh, there's there's no basis whatsoever. In fact, in my article over at the dissenter at Substack, uh, the CIA actually said that they themselves don't even believe Edward Snowden joined their agency with the intent to leak documents. There was a 60 Minutes production that was done. Uh, they were putting out this propaganda. They themselves said that's not what they believe. They don't think Edward Snowden joined C to then join the NSA to then leak documents to journalists and then flee to Hong Kong and go in Russia and then ever your favorite conspiracy theory suggests. So um, this, is, this is incredible here. Think about, okay, here's what I find to be so amazing about Malcolm Nance is doing here. Okay, if you're not familiar with him, let me just introduce Malcolm by saying he has nearly 500,000 followers on Twitter. He has a huge influence over people who are liberal Democrats. He's a MSNBC analyst for well over a year, if not nearly two years. People who are supporters of Reality Winner have been begging him, begging him to support them. Why? Because he has been profiting off of the whole hysteria and, and all of this frenzy around Trump and Russia for the last year to two years, he actually rebranded himself just so that he could cash in. He used to be a run-of-the-mill counterterrorism analyst. He's published work in the last few years about Trump being influenced by Russia so that he could continue to boost himself on MSNBC. And so they were asking him, because it seems natural that because of what Reality Winner believed she was doing, he would support her. And he, and he ignored and he ignored and he ignored. And I, I, I suppose because he's attached to Joy Reid's show that now there was a natural um, meeting of people here. Billy Winner Davis ended up in the same segment as him. But he 
undermined everything that went up with this segment. Because as I said, they're pitting reality winner against Edward Snowden. They're saying that Edward Snowden is the bad whistleblower. And they're saying that reality winner is supposed to be this whistleblower that you're able to support. And so uh, now um, it, it's pretty clear to me that, uh, sorry, it's pretty clear to me that Malcolm Nance is doing the very thing that he wasn't expected to do. He was not brought on this segment to bash Reality Winner. He was not asked to give his opinion about what Reality Winner did wrong. He was supposed to praise her, if anything, and help Billy Winner Davis make the case for why she should be given clemency. And so then he's saying all of this garbage about how she needs to show remorse, um, she needs to apologize. It, it shows that he's so terribly uninformed about this case. They're having an analyst come on air and talk about a whistleblower case in which he knows nothing. So it's not even the, like, you find this at across all of the cable networks, people invited on TV to talk about subjects of which they know absolutely nothing about. She pled guilty. She signed an agreement. She accepted responsibility. And when she did it, I was at the hearing. She apologized to the judge. She said, you know, that she didn't think she had made the right choice because that's what you have to do in order to walk away with that deal, with that agreement. And so for him to say this, it just shows how ignorant and stupid he is as an analyst when it comes to this topic. Not to mention, he doesn't have any understanding about how you whistle blow in how you blow the whistle in government. Her not comparable to the Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, who formed the basis of part of the impeachment case against Donald Trump, the first one. That person was a highly influential person who could get op-eds published in the New York Times, who could go to Congress and get someone to listen. How is Reality Winner going to go to Congress and go to listen to what she has to say? And Reality Winner, if she went to her supervisor and said anything, she would be treated as if she was an insider threat for the rest of her time as a contractor working for the NSA. They would monitor closely. She'd be under total surveillance. They'd listen to her politics against Donald Trump and she would have been targeted. And she eventually could have found herself forced out. She probably wouldn't have been able to get promotions. And, and I think she would have been under a lot of stress with them knowing she was anti-Trump. And we also know from her text messages that she was supportive of WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden. And so that would have made uh, them uh, target her even more. Um, and so she wouldn't have wanted to go to a supervisor. And she, she can't go to an inspector general, general's office and expect them to take action. She's just a low-level person. And on top of that, we have a history with inspector general offices in the NSA passing on those disclosures and, and, and instead giving the names of the person who made the disclosure to the Justice Department for a leak investigation. It's what happened to Bill Binney, Kirk Wiebe, and Ed Loomis when they revealed, um, when, when they did their whistleblowing back in the 2000s. So it's just absolutely ridiculous what Malcolm Nance is saying. Um, go ahead, we'll finish the clip. Show remorse come out and expose, you know, what she did. We all know what that is. And to show that in comparison, General Michael Flynn, the former director of Defense Intelligence Agency, was, I mean, was committing crimes that he admitted to the FBI. Put it in context. Uh, you know, there's a system out there now. There's a new president. And, uh, you know, it won't be considered a corrupt pardon if reality winner is released, as opposed to, I don't know, Steve Bannon. Yeah. And, and is, is that something that you intend to do, uh, Ms. Winter Davis? Do you do you intend to, to try to seek a pardon for your daughter? And do you are you hopeful that it could happen now that there is an administration that actually sees Russia as an adversary and not as something to uh, aspire to uh, duplicate? So right now, reality has a petition um, for clemency on file, and that's pretty much what we're pushing right now. Just commute her sentence. Let her out. She is suffering not only in a maximum security prison, but in a maximum security prison that is infected with COVID. 
and also they're in lockdown conditions. She is suffering and I just want her home. I want her out. We can look at the idea of a pardon later on, but what I want right now is I want Joe Biden to look at her. She's no threat at all to society. Um, there is no reason to keep her locked away in prison at this time. And I just want for President Biden to look at her and to commute her sentence and bring her home. Yeah. Well, I, we hope that um, your daughter does get that opportunity to, and that the Biden administration will take a second look at this case. Billy Winter Davis, Malcolm Nance, thank you both very much. And that is tonight's readout. All right. So um, at, at least it ends that way. At least Billy Winter Davis gets to have the last word. At least she use, she's able to make the crucial point. Uh, and, and I say that, you know, it's it's not like I think she shouldn't have accepted the invitation to go on air. Of course, when you're in her situation and you, you haven't been able to get them to re, to to book you yet, you 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 take this opportunity. But uh, to close out, uh, you know, the, this this idea that uh, you know reality winner um, can get a pardon um, if she ex expresses remorse. Uh, as as I said, she already has expressed remorse, even though I don't think she really has to, but she did it because she wanted to get the sentence that she, she received and, and not have a worse one. Um, I suppose that might've been possible if she had gone to trial, although she did get an unprecedented sentence, the longest one for a leaker in the history of, uh, of these cases. So, uh, and, uh, you, you know, just the, the whole thread running throughout that uh i mean i need to add separately as like a political matter as i conclude here that um there's a there's a vast record of actions that the government took under donald trump that maintained some kind of tensions with russia maintained some kind of opposition to russia so this idea that joe biden is something to depart from donald trump and be less um coddling of the russian government false. Uh, and uh, I put that out there, not because I think that we need to be supportive of the Putin government. I mean, obviously, that's not why I'm, I'm saying these things, but I am saying it because they are a nuclear power. And I dread tensions between our two countries because we've been there before. And it makes it, and it is pretty maddening, if not anxiety inducing the possibility that something can go wrong if we escalate the conflict too much um, in, in any part of the globe. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think that's a new low. To me, that's a new low. It's a new low to me. It goes beyond just Joy Reid attacking Snowden. It goes beyond, um, well, at the time um, she hadn't married, um, I believe her name is Melissa Harris Lacewell now, but um, Melissa was a host who had argued that Edward Snowden was wrong to flee the country. He should have stayed here. And like Martin Luther King Jr., he should have engaged in civil disobedience and gone to trial and essentially martyred himself. And it wasn't fair for him to go live in exile. And he needed to come back and face up to his sins. That was something that MSNBC has promoted against Edward Snowden. Uh, so I'll say here, this is the final thing. This is the thing that is most important. Edward Snowden went on last word uh, or sorry, he went on 11th hour with Brian Williams. He gave an interview last year in September, and he said that if he was going to demand a pardon for anyone who was a victim of these Espionage Act prosecutions, he would start with reality winner Terry Albury and Daniel Everett Hale, who are people who have been charged. They were charged under President Donald Trump. Um, he said that these are people he would want to be pardoned, and he put them before himself. And he's been highly supportive of reality. This is why, uh, the, from, from what I can tell in the clip, Billy Winter Davis never took the bait. She didn't attack Edward Snowden during the segment, you'll notice. Uh, and uh, she stayed true to what she came to do with that segment and, and spoke about the need for clemency for her daughter without letting MSNBC them into things that their little partisan hate machine want to have their engage in. So, um, you know, like I said, 
it's 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 my struggle to try and make sure that people who support whistleblowers aren't at each other's throats. And I think there's the, 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 no one whistleblower is better than the other. They each have their own impacts. And I'm not I'm not suggesting that what Reality Winner revealed is equal to what Edward Snowden revealed. Just that we need to take on these cases separately. And you know I don't think less of Reality Winner because she released one document. She didn't release thousands of documents, and those thousands of documents weren't more impactful than what Edward Snowden disclosed. Uh, I don't think that's a trap to fall into like that. That encourages us to attack people who are at the moment in positions where we need to back them and support them so that they are no longer victims of political prosecution. And that's that's really always to be said. Um, I, we sh we've been going for a long time. I want to let Brian go. I've been holding him hostage through my deconstruction of this clip. Well, let and, me add uh, real quick, you know, Joy Reid, if you want to do a segment bashing Ed Snowden, do a segment on Ed Snowden. Don't drag the poor mother of an incarcerated person onto national television as a fucking political football. Like, go fuck yourself. Uh, yeah. To me, no, that it's... is one of the most heinous things that you can possibly do. You know, if you want to have a conversation about reality winner versus Ed Snowden, have it after the segment. Let reality's poor mother off the television set and away from this fucking idiot, Malcolm Nance. <laughs> Uh, that, that's kind of how I feel about it. You know, there's no reason that woman has been through more than enough in the last few years. Why does he have to be there? Why does Malcolm have to be up? She could have done the same. Bring him in after. Bring him in after. Yeah. I, if like, you have you know, to have. Yeah. Like, disgusting. it's, I mean, the equivalent would be, it's, it's essentially like, um, you know, just imagine if a segment you were invited on to talk about a political prisoner and the whole time they're like, how come people support this other political prisoner? Then you, it'd be like, what if they, somebody came up to you? They're like, why do so many people support Mumia Abu Jamal over Leonard Peltier? And you're like, what does that even have to do with anything? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, what it's a cynical horrible question. It's, it's cynical. It's disgusting. And it kind of just gives away the whole game. You know, if you yeah. wanted to do a propaganda segment, do it after reality winner's mother who's begging for clemency for her daughter in a pandemic gets off the television set. That would be my only ask. So All right. um, why don't you tell people about the, the newsletter and then we'll go. This chat, by the way, we've got some characters and, and I, I can't figure out if some of these are like legit people here to watch the show or if you're all just out for some shit disturbing today or what, but uh, for those of you who do genuinely want to watch this show, thank you for tuning in. And uh, the newsletter that I curate is center. It's over at dissenter.substack.com. This is a fantastic way for you to help keep our weekly going and also to support the coverage of whistleblower stories that we do. And uh it, it's it, there's you know there's a number of people who have signed up to subscribe for it and I'm very grateful for them. It has helped me continue my constant of Julian Assange's case, and uh, and so yeah, uh, if you're able to sign up, that would be be welcome. And then also, uh, uh, if you want to support us, um, you can you can. You already subscribed to this channel, I hope, um, unless you're some kind of a bot here. So <laughs> Discord. But um, also, uh, we're, we've been doing streams on Mondays and Wednesdays. I've been doing streams on Mondays and Wednesdays, inviting guests on if I'm able to get them. Uh, the person I wanted to have yesterday, that kind of fell through. Um, but I, had a, I did an interview on Monday with Andrew Parrott. Perez and uh, he's at the Daily Post and their work is crucial this week. I can't shout it enough. Go read the Daily Poster, subscribe if you can. They are doing important work on the survival checks and they are challenging uh, media propaganda, uh, corporate media propaganda, and they are challenging the corporate politics of both parties, Democrats and Republicans, and challenging 
Joe Biden's administration as they water down these survival checks and back away things that need to be done in order to give direct aid to people impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. So support their work. I like what they're doing. It's basic follow the money journalism. Don't do it so somebody else does and they do it. So we're happy to tell people to go support them because it's kind of mm-hmm. outside of our lane. It's um, we, we're doing, I'm, I'm following these whistleblowing stories um, and we're also keeping tabs on, um, on on stories with prisoners who are activists who are facing retaliation. Um, that's so. I mean, we just don't. I just don't have the bandwidth to do a lot of the stuff that the Daily Poster is doing. So I'm glad that there's an outlet like them that has been grow, a scrappy kind of grassroots mm-hmm. funded model mm-hmm. of reporting, really taking advantage of Substack. And it's also, let me just say this about it: it's it's using the Substack platform with its full potential because instead of just one person who got kicked off out of their, mm. like, like Matt Iglesias running from Vox cause people no longer wanted to work with him. And now he's just <laughs> saying the same old, same old, you know, it's giving people jobs. They're hiring reporters at mm-hmm. the daily poster. There's, there's, it's not just David Sirota's thing. It's three other people, including Andrew who are doing this work. So I think, so to me, I, I'm inspired. I, I my descent yep. there. And that's what well, we paid Jeffrey Sterling to do a piece last year for us. And I, I see it as kind of a model of like, you know, can I there's some guests? Can I have more contributions? And if you subscribe to this new let, newsletter, I'm able to expand it beyond just myself center. That's something I look forward to doing in 2021. That's more yeah. than I needed to that's more than I needed to say, but I wanted to work that in here as we wrap. Uh, so thank you everyone for following along. Uh, and um, yeah, I'll just say uh, the, the the final thing uh, that I've been paying attention to some reports about how uh, voices um, have have been deplant deplatformed or demonetized on YouTube in the last two to three days. Uh, people who um, you know, I, 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 I can't see any justification for why YouTube is removing them. Um, like Ford Fisher, I don't know if you saw this, Brian, but he goes to like DC protests and he films, he films happening at protests. He'll go to Proud Boy demonstrations and he'll film what they're doing, or he'll go to a Black Lives Matter demonstration and he'll film it. He'll film how police respond to them. He'll film counter demonstrations, etc. So YouTube has demonetized him because they said that his content is too controversial and, um, and he, and he was showing it off and he's, he's, you know, he's, it's, to me, it's really troubling. Um, there's, there's something going on here that we're going to need to pay close attention because there's not a lot of recourse for us if we get censored. Um, or, or if we're, we no longer can bring in a revenue stream, we're pretty much, um, you know, whatever we do, we're, we have to submit to what the ultimate decision is of this massive corporation. And so um, I just wanted to say that I, that I am aware that this is happening. So far, I haven't seen that kind of activity against our channel. But if it does happen, I'll be the first to let people know on social media and also, um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know what it, what it means to be controversial is so vague um, because just talking about subjects that advertisers don't want to be aligned with or associated with, I think that makes you controversial and it means that you start to um, find that you, you, you can't bring in money for the journalism that you're doing on some of these platforms. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, that's why we are on as many different platforms and to create all this extra work for ourselves. <laughs> but like I said yesterday, like we're not reliant. We're not reliant on this revenue from YouTube. It just helps us do a little extra yeah. work. It helps us fund some extra stuff. But so it's good that you know if if we were to lose whatever we're bringing in from the little bit we do here, that yeah, uh, I mean we can play we with content moderation doing. rules and. And this and that, but until we take communications out of the hands of corporations, I, you know, I think we're going to keep playing this whack-a-mole. So, 
As always, capitalism is the problem. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. Uh, make sure you subscribe to Kevin's newsletter. It's fantastic. Um, keep an eye on Shadowproof. We're publishing some cool stuff this week and coming up very shortly. I think next week we'll have our first Marvel Cook piece, which is very exciting. We've been working on that for a few months. Um, and while we're shouting out Daily Poster, go on over to Truthout and check out the new reporting fellowship that they just launched in honor of my good friend Maya Shenwar's sister who passed away last year. Um, so please check that out as well and support them. They do fantastic journalism at Truthout. So thank yeah, you, Candace Kevin. Byrne had a good story. Candace Byrne had a good story about what the Biden administration, the wall, the yeah. Trump's wall. They're great over there. So check them out. Spread the love around and um, have a safe and good weekend, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.